Hi everyone and welcome to Miss Estric Biology. Some of my most popular videos have been my photosynthesis ones, so I wanted to give you a one-stop video for all of it. And I'm talking the light-dependent reaction, light-independent reaction, the Calvin apparatus, basically everything you need to know. If you do want more help with your A-levels and don't forget to check out my flashcards, I've got them for OCR and for AQA and I'll link them in the description below. But for now, let's get into it. So the first thing to do with photosynthesis is knowing where it occurs and just a mini recap on the structure of a chloroplast because you need to know where each stage of photosynthesis happens. So here on our chloroplast, we can see the thylakoid stacks and the thylakoid membrane is on the outside of that. And that's where you have these folded membranes where you have all the proteins embedded for the electron carrier chain and also ATP synthase. And that is where the light dependent reactions occur. A stack of them is called a granum. The fluid part in the centre is called the stroma and that's where the light independent reactions happen. And you have lots of enzymes there for those. And then we have the inner and outer membranes as well, which are controlling what can enter and exit. Photosynthesis is a two stage reaction. We have the light dependent and the light independent reactions. And the light dependent reactions happen first. And as the name suggests, it requires light. This happens on the thylakoid membrane, or you could call that the granum. In this light dependent reaction stage, light energy is used and water to create ATP and reduced NADP. And those two products are required for the light independent stage, which comes second. So there's four key steps here. We have photolysis, or sometimes it's pronounced photolysis to remember the stage, photoionization of chlorophyll and chemiosmosis. Now those are actually the three processes. Production of ATP and reduced NADP is the outcome. But AQA states these are the four key stages that you need to know. So starting with photolysis or photolysis, photo refers to light, lysis means splitting. So photolysis of water means light energy is absorbed and then that splits the water. And it splits it into oxygen, electrons and protons which are hydrogen ions what then happens is the protons are picked up by nadp to form reduced nadp or nadph and that is then used in the light independent reaction the electrons are passed along a chain of electron carriers and the oxygen is either used in respiration, but it's not used in photosynthesis. So if it isn't needed for respiration, it will diffuse out through the stomata. We'll go through in a bit more detail what happens to the protons and electrons when we get to chemiosmosis. Photoionization of chlorophyll, again, is to do with light, because we've got photo. So light energy is absorbed by the chlorophyll and the ionization part is referring to the fact that the, the light energy results in the electrons gaining energy. And we describe that as them becoming excited and raising up an energy level. And that causes the electrons to leave the chlorophyll. And therefore, the chlorophyll has been ionized. Some of the energy from the released electrons is used to make ATP and reduced NADP in chemiosmosis. So let's have a look at chemiosmosis then, because this then links it all together for the light dependent reactions. So we've said that the electrons gain energy from the chlorophyll will be released from the chlorophyll. What happens is those electrons move along a series of proteins embedded within the thylakoid membrane. And as those electrons move along the proteins, they release energy. And some of that energy is used to pump those protons from the stroma across a protein and into the thylakoid lumen. This then results in a concentration gradient being built up, but we actually call it an electrochemical gradient because we have a charged molecule, so we have ions there. So now we have this electrochemical gradient that enables the protons to move by facilitated diffusion back down their concentration gradient to the stroma. But the only protein that they can attach to is ATP synthase. And as the protons attach and move through ATP synthase, that enables the enzyme, which the protons move through, to phosphorylate the ADP 
into ATP. So that's how the ATP is produced. We then have the protons back on the stroma side, and this is how we create NADP um, that is reduced or reduced NADP. So the NADP coenzyme picks up the electrons from the end of the electron transport chain. It picks up the protons after they've passed through ATP synthase, and that reduces NADP, which makes it NADPH. So now we've created ATP and reduced NADP. Those two molecules are used in the light independent reactions, also known as the Calvin cycle. This occurs in the stroma. It requires enzymes and the enzyme Rubisco is the enzyme that you need to know. And because of that, this stage is temperature sensitive, but it doesn't require light energy for the Calvin cycle to occur. Now the Calvin cycle uses carbon dioxide as well as the two products from the light dependent reactions and we create a hexose sugar. The ATP that is needed is hydrolyzed to provide energy for the reaction and the reduced NADP is used to donate the hydrogen to reduce the molecule GP within the cycle. So let's go through this cycle then. The first part of the cycle we'll look at is how the carbon dioxide enters the cycle. So carbon dioxide reacts with RUBP, and that is a five carbon compound. So all of these yellow circles are representing carbon molecules. So we can see we've got a five carbon compound reacting with carbon dioxide, which only has one carbon. That would result in a six carbon compound, but actually it's unstable, so it's split into two three carbon compounds and that's our GP. So we have two lots of GP. This is then where one of the ATP molecules is used and it's where the reduced NADP is used. GP picks up the hydrogen and therefore NADP is reformed and the GP is now reduced to form TP. That reduction requires energy from ATP. The TP is then used for two things. One of the carbons is removed from these two times three carbon compounds and it goes towards creating a hexose sugar. That will leave behind five carbons, but as a three carbon compound and a two carbon compound. So ATP is needed to form those back together, or in other words, regenerate RUBP. Now, that is just one round of the cycle, and that only created one carbon, which isn't enough for a hexo sugar. Hexose means six. So the Calvin cycle has to happen six times before a hexo sugar is made. And that could be glucose, it could be sucrose, and then the plant can use that glucose or sucrose and convert it into whatever organic compound is needed. So that could be another carbohydrate, so cellulose for the cell walls. It could be a store of glucose in the form of starch, or it could convert the hexose sugar into glycerol and then combine with fatty acids to make lipids, or it could combine it with nitrates to form the amino acids. Now you need to know a little bit about limiting factors as well and the limiting factor is anything that reduces the rate of photosynthesis and that could be light intensity, carbon dioxide concentration or temperature. And the way you can look at a graph to tell what is currently limiting the rate of reaction is wherever you have a positive correlation on the graph that tells you that whatever is on the x-axis is currently limiting the rate. So that means up until this point, or probably a bit further up to here, light intensity is limiting the rate of reaction. And we know that because as we increase the light intensity, the rate increased. But that then starts to plateau and level off. So even though you add more light, the rate doesn't increase. And what that means is there must be another factor that is now limiting the rate and that must be either carbon dioxide concentration or temperature. So it's the same concept with carbon dioxide concentration that as the rate is increasing and the carbon dioxide concentration is increasing, we know that carbon dioxide is a limiting factor until it plateaus. 
temperature, this is linked to the idea of enzymes because it's an enzyme controlled reaction. So at low temperatures, the rate of reaction is lower because we don't have enough successful collisions. There's not enough kinetic energy. We don't get enough enzyme substrate complexes. But if it gets too hot, the enzyme denatures. Now the carbon dioxide, if you had to say why that limits, that is because it is a reactant in the Calvin cycle. Light intensity can limit the rate of reaction because light energy is needed in the light dependent reactions for photolysis and photoionization. So for maximum photosynthesis in agriculture, when they're growing crops, they need to consider how they can remove those limiting factors to maximize their profits. So sometimes you get application questions linked to this. So the idea of adding in artificial lighting, um, heat in a greenhouse, and that could be through burning fuels because that will also produce carbon dioxide. But all of those additions cost. So it has to be considered whether the cost of the additional light, heat or fuel is offset by the additional profit. So they have to make sure it's cost effective in order for it to be worthwhile to pay for those additional conditions. So here we have Calvin's apparatus and within this equipment one of the key things you need to know is it's all about the incorporation of a carbon-14 isotope, so a radioactive form of carbon and that is so that it can easily be traced and tracked throughout the different carbon containing molecules as it's been absorbed and passed on. So in this way they were able to visualize the distribution of radioactivity in the plant material or in other words, they were able to discover and understand the Calvin cycle. So let's have a look at the equipment. So although this isn't an extensive list of everything, this is like the key pieces of equipment that you might be asked to justify. So the lollipop flask, syringe, rapid action tap, hot methanol or alcohol ethanol, the carbon isotope and the algae. So first of all, we've got a funnel at the top here and that is so that you can add the algae into the flask. The syringe is how you are inserting the radioactive or the isotope form of the carbon into the experiment. And in that way, because all the other um, chambers exposed to the air are closed off, the algae only has access to carbon dioxide in the form of this radioactive isotope. So as the plant is photosynthesizing in the Calvin cycle when carbon dioxide is combining with RUBP, it's combining in that radioactive form of carbon. The hot methanol at the bottom is to denature enzymes. So what happens is this rapid action tap that can open and close really quickly. So you can get samples at really precise moments in time. And that sample drops straight into this hot alcohol. And because that then denatures the enzymes, that means that photosynthesis will stop, all reactions will stop completely. So then you can analyze the quantity of that radioactive carbon, the isotope in all of the different molecules. And that gives you a snapshot of that exact period of time, how much isotope, that carbon isotope was there in each molecule. So the advantages of the flat lollipop flask are first of all, because it is flat on the two sides, you have this larger surface area. And that means more of the algae will be exposed to light and therefore the rate of the light dependent reactions will be faster and you should therefore see any changes in the light dependent reaction more rapidly as well. The other thing is you can simultaneously be injecting in that carbon dioxide and taking samples at the same time. Now the method itself you wouldn't be expected to remember because this isn't on the spec. As I said it's a common application question so it probably tell you the method and maybe ask you to explain why they did certain stages. So the first step is the isolation of the chloroplasts and this links really well to topic two where you learn about cell ultracentrifugation. So to isolate the chloroplast, they would have to homogenize a sample of cells. So break open the cells, they would then have to filter the large debris and then they could centrifuge to isolate out the different pellets and the chloroplasts come to the second pellet. So that's how they could isolate the chloroplasts then we've got the incorporation of the carbon-14 isotope. So this is when the carbon is being injected in, in the form of carbon dioxide, into the apparatus. And they would need to leave the apparatus for a set period of time under the exact conditions that they want to do the experiment in to allow that carbon dioxide to be fully incorporated into 
all of those carbon containing compounds in the Calvin cycle. The perfusion stage is referring to the fact that they can then simultaneously continue to inject in that carbon-14 isotope in the form of the carbon dioxide, whilst also taking samples through that rapid action tap. And in that way, they can get multiple samples at precise periods of time and measure the exact quantity of that carbon isotope in all of the different carbon-containing compounds. That then leads us on to the measurement of radioactivity, and this they would be using autoradiography for. And for that, that is basically a way to measure the quantity of radioactive substances in each of those carbon-containing compounds. Lastly comes the analysis of the results, and this is more where the questions come in. So let's have a look at a typical set of results you could get. So you could be shown data like this, where we've got the amount of each radioactive substance, and we've got when it was all set up in the light, and then turning off the lights, have exactly the same setup, but in the dark. And this is often what they would do, so that you get this direct comparison of what happens in the light, what happens in the dark, to show that even though it's called the light independent reaction, why there is actually a change in effect when the lights are turned off. So in this particular example, we've got information on GP, glucose, and RUBP. Most of the time when I've seen this exam question, they actually only include GP and RUBP, but because this one did have glucose as well, I thought let's put it in and we can explain all three. So the first common thing you might be asked to explain is why there is a high amount of radioactive substance in GP in the light. Now for that, sometimes it's asked as a comparison to RUBP, and the idea here is thinking about how many carbons each of those compounds contains. So GP is a three carbon compound, but you have two GP molecules within that Calvin cycle. You only have one RUBP, and that's a five carbon compound. So you're always going to have a higher amount of radioactivity in GP compared to RUBP because it contains more carbons and it is the carbon that is radioactive. The next question, what caused the amount of radioactively labelled glucose to decrease in the dark? So the first thing you've got to remember is in the Calvin cycle, where is the glucose coming from? And in every turn of the Calvin cycle, one of the carbons from the TP goes towards making a hexo sugar such as glucose. So if the glucose is decreasing, that must mean the amount of TP is decreasing. So we need to have a think about why that might be the case. So when it goes dark, that means the light dependent reactions would stop. And that means you won't be getting any reduced NADP or ATP. And those two compounds are required in the Calvin cycle to reduce GP into TP. So that is what is happening here. That GP is not being reduced to form triosphosphate or TP. And therefore, we've got an increase in GP, we'll have a decrease in TP, and because there's a decrease in TP, the amount of glucose has decreased. Now, I've actually already partly explained number three. So why did the GP levels rise in the dark? So it's that same idea. In the dark, the light-dependent reactions would stop, so there'd be no more ATP or reduced NADP being created, and those two are both needed to reduce GP into TP. Therefore, that doesn't happen, so you get a build-up of GP. Finally, why did RUBP levels decrease in the dark. So this happens because the RUBP is still able to combine with the carbon dioxide using the enzyme Rubisco to form GP. But that GP is not being converted into TP and therefore there's no TP available to regenerate RUBP. There's also no ATP which is needed to regenerate the TP into RUBP. So the RUBP is still being used but it's not being regenerated. Now, ultimately, if this went on for long enough in the dark, then you would find the GP levels would also decrease because if you run out of RUBP, then you won't be able to make GP.